So now, here's John Metapaul, no need to announce him. And his topic is two concepts, almost no waiting. Please give a warm applause. Thank you. I will explain the almost in the course of the talk, but uh, it was a slight change that happened recently. First of all, for the people that do not know me, I was inspired yesterday by Bedell's talk where he explained his history with Debian. And although I haven't had quite as tight a history with Debian, I have had a history in computer science and particularly with Linux since 1994. I've been a large number of different jobs. Um, a lot of people think of me as this kind of a marketing somewhat technical guy who goes around giving away free software, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> but uh, at one time I was a programmer and I did teach operating system design and compiler design when I was teaching in university. So I do have a technical side to me also. In 1994, I saw Linus Torvalds for the first time and saw Linux for the first time. And working at Digital Equipment Corporation, trying to promote the alpha system, I saw this as a perfect uh, target to do computer science research. Uh, the ability to distribute the code freely after you've done the research, and particularly in large address spaces, which the alpha had, I saw this as a perfect thing. And then later on, I saw it not just as an educational and research vehicle, or a technological thing for computer geeks, but I saw it as a commercially valuable system. And so in 1995, I became the executive director of a small organization called Linux International, which is made up of some very small fledgling companies that were trying to promote Linux. And at that time, we developed the Linux Mark Institute to protect the Linux trademark so that anybody could use it for any legitimate purpose. We created, uh, helped to create the Linux Professional Institute for doing certification that is uh, distribution neutral. And we created the Linux Standard Base Project, which continues to today. And then I've spent the last 20 years trying to promote Linux worldwide to companies, to universities, to governments. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, who is Arm and Linero? Most of you know that ARM is a corporation that uh, develops a architecture for CPUs, GPUs, and other types of processing units. They design the architecture and license it out to companies like Broadcom, Samsung, and others to actually create chips, unlike Intel and AMD, who both create the architecture and manufacture the chips. Uh, a few years ago, what was happening was all these companies producing these chips were hiring, say, 50 engineers apiece and trying to port Linux onto their chips and onto their system, onto chips SOCs and other types of boards. And then all of them would be sending a patch to Linus Torvalds to say, oh, Linus, here's a patch for the kernel that handles the memory management system and ARM architecture. And Linus would end up with 50 patches all purporting to do the same thing, and of course having different code in them. And he was getting fairly exasperated with this. And so a friend of mine, David Rustling, who actually wrote the first bootloader for Alpha Linux called Milo, was a fellow at ARM, and he decided to uh, start an organization called Linero, which has the idea of cooperation of all these companies, coming together and saying, let's collaborate on this, let's all pour our resources together, and you have two engineers that you assign to us, along with some money, and we will create the patches that will go to Linus. And so now Linus gets one patch coming to him from Linero. And we, we work on more than just the kernel. We also work on tool chains and testing mechanisms and various other things in the ARM ecosystem. Now, most of the people in the room, I mean, if you haven't heard of, I'll ask the question, who has not heard of the Raspberry Pi? Okay. <laughs> 
Now, the reason the Raspberry Pi was created was because professors at the University of Cambridge were a little bit concerned that students coming into the university actually knew less about how computers worked than students of 20 years ago. Because the students of today coming into the university, they get a laptop bought for them, or maybe they buy it themselves, and on the laptop it says, you open this thing up and you void your warranty. <gasps> Well, of course, we don't want to do that because if the thing breaks, our warranty is voided. So you never open that up. And then you go and you, you get a game at your local store. You pull it down off the web. Or you pirate it from your favorite friend or whatever. And you put that on your computer. And you don't have to compile it. You don't have to debug it. You know, this is, this is not like it was 20, 25 years ago when you had a Commodore 64 and you copied the program from the bulletin board over the net and you typed it in, you got these things called syntax errors and you got these things like buffer overflows and all sorts of weird, nasty stuff and you had to figure it out. And so the professors were really, really upset about this and they decided to create a computer that purposely did not come in a case, purposely was small enough to fit in a student's pocket, purposely was cheap enough that if you blew it up, it wasn't the end of the world. And they stuck these things on there, magical things, called GPIO pins. General purpose input-output that you could then, you know, cause these pins to put out signals. And then all of a sudden, there were these prototyping boards that showed up that people could start designing things. And then there was a website that shared the designs with different people and the source code was published. Does this sound familiar to you? This is like we did it. 25 years ago, only back in those days the computer might cost a little bit more and the circuit board being fairly expensive, I still remember the day when a transistor, a single transistor, cost a dollar twenty-five. And the Raspberry Pi was only three watts of power. So this, of course, and when they started, they thought they'd only need a thousand of them. And then they updated it to, to ten thousand. And then, by the time they took the first order, it was 100,000 systems, and in the first year, they manufactured a million. And this year, they're looking at five million. So it's been a little bit of a success. <laughs> now, it all, of course, sponsored some clones. Along came some companies over in China and says, hey, we can create the banana pie, okay? And we're going to make it a little bit better. Dual core ARM. Now this is a little bit more interesting from a computer science standpoint because if you're putting an operating system on there, of course, having dual cores means that you can actually have one CPU interrupting the other and you can have race conditions and all sorts of other interesting things. It had a gigabyte of RAM. It had a, a SATA connector, which was really nice because it gave some decent input output. And it had gigabit Ethernet versus a, versus a Raspberry Pi only having uh, 10, 100 megabit per second Ethernet. Slightly more power, but hey, it only cost a couple dollars more. And then, of course, the Raspberry Pi people came back with an even better Raspberry Pi. Four cores, now we're really beginning interesting. Unfortunately, only a gigabyte of RAM and, uh, and no input-output device. And it's still kind of working off of the USB 2.0 bus. So then we came out with the Banana Pro, <laughs> you know, which, which had uh, a gradual improvement. But when you actually take a look out on the internet, you find all these tiny little computers, and they all are very interesting in one way or the other. And, and even you even have some Intel interesting computers like the Galileo over there. I'm not afraid to mention it. There it is, <laughs> you know. But you know, they're all computers that people can touch and put our favorite operating systems on. And then you have things like the Adaptiva's uh, parallel board, which not only has a two-core ARM9 processor, but also has a field programmable gate array. Now, we've known how to build these for a long, for a long period of time, a very long period of time. It's just that they probably would take up this entire room to build what's there on that chip right now. And would cost many thousands of dollars when you could buy this chip for a much lower price. It has some digital signal processing chips on it. 
And on this particular board, it even has a 16 core or 64 core CPU where each core has 32 kilobytes of memory that's associated only with that core. So that you can load your programs and your data into that core and work on them in parallel. And people go, oh, bad dog, 32K of memory, what can you do in that? Let me tell you something, I programmed for the first 10 years of my life and had less than 32 kilobytes of memory on my computer system, okay? And if you remember, CPM used to work in 64K of memory, and that had the operating system in it and a whole bunch of other stuff, and we got along fine. And it only uses five watts of power. I will point out that for a, long, a certain number of months, this was the fastest, most power efficient Bitcoin mining CPU on the market. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the latest in my little reign of computers, the BBC's micro bit. The BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, has gone in with some other corporations to create a tiny little computer system that they want to make cheap enough to actually hand out for free to every, seven, every seventh grade student in the entire United Kingdom. And they're going to be working this into their program. So Doctor Who will be having a micro bit. <laughs> and, you know, an East Side Street or whatever they call it will be having micro bits worked into the programming to interest the students in, in programming that. So besides all of that, why am I showing you all of this? It's because of things like this. This is my latest little hobby. I wanted to put together a nice little, um, in effect, Beowulf computer system and made it out of Banana Pros. And, uh, and it, it, it worked very well. I had uh, altogether six gigabytes of random in it and six HDMI ports so I could have a decent number of screens. And six SATA ports, although I only used it on, on the two. So if you notice, there's two levels to this. There's the bottom level. And on the very bottom level, it has an eight port gigabit switch. The next level up has two one terabyte disk drives taken out of a notebook. And, and above that, the, the bottom two banana pies are, pro, are, are controlling those two disks. And then up above that are just, C, in effect, CPU units. And the whole thing uses, including the switch, 70 watts of power. But the biggest thing for me was the fact that it actually fit in a standard size briefcase. And so I can take this standard size briefcase around the universities and stuff like that in a small amount of time, put it together so that I can demonstrate various things to them. Now, what type of various things can I show? Well, I could show high performance computing using OpenMP, MPI, you know, a variety of other different types of free software. I can also set it up as a highly available system doing mirrored disks and being able to show heartbeats and be able to show the fact of failover and that type of thing. I can use it to do heterogeneous computing. I can put, pardon me for saying this, other operating systems on there, such as BSD or the herd or Erno and stuff. And, 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 and I've been told that in the future sometime, I might even be able to put Windows 10 on one of those systems and be able to show heterogeneous computing with that. Likewise, I could do heterogeneous systems administration on there. Now, I know that we can do this very simply by using virtual machines and things like that, but, you know, it isn't as exciting as when you can actually see the lights blinking and, 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 and not hear the disk moving and stuff. That's the type of stuff. And I wanted it to be very, so I wanted it to be very modular and as time goes on, as I get find more and less expensive and more powerful CPUs, I can unplug some and put some more in there. Now, this was the first version of this. This is the first prototype, and I made it out of things like plexiglass, which is very expensive and stuff. And so I want to go back through now and, and substitute other materials with the drawings of where you drill the holes and everything else and, and reduce the cost so it should be able to get down to less than $400, maybe even less than $300, and actually have more powerful processors up the stack. When I say more powerful processors, I'm talking about things like this. This is, a little, this is an eight-core ARM64 chip inside of here with a gigabyte of memory, and this particular system costs about $100 US dollars. 
And we'll talk more about this later on. So contest number one is sponsored by actually three different companies, one of which is called Invenio. Invenio is a, is a nonprofit organization on, in San Francisco. I first met them at one of the first Linux worlds in Moscone Center in San Francisco many years ago. They are in the, in the business of bringing electronics to places where electronics probably shouldn't even be, or not shouldn't be, but couldn't normally be, because there's no electricity there. No electricity, no telephone, no nothing. And they bring telephony and electronics to these places. They have satellite links to reach up to a satellite for the communications, and they have uh, some method of creating electricity, whether it be a solar panel, a water wheel, or in this particular case, a bicycle with an alternator on the back of the bicycle charging batteries. Interesting side story on this, they would go into these villages in Africa and they would say, okay, here's the system. What type of power source do you want? A solar cell or a bicycle? And the village chiefs would look at them and say, we want the bicycle. And, and Vinny, why? The solar panel's so easy. It's just you got plenty of sunshine. They say, yes. But when the solar panel breaks, it's a long way to get one. And number two, it costs a lot of money, which we don't have. But we have lots of broken but trucks and lots of broken bicycles. And so we can take an alternator out of the broken truck and we can fix the broken bicycle to pedal. But most importantly, the bicycle creates a job for somebody pedaling it. Shows a slight difference between their thought processes and Western thought processes. And, and some of these Emerging, I don't like the word, word third world countries. I don't like that phrase at all. So I usually say emerging economies. But in this case, I will use third world countries because another place they are very good is like in disaster areas like New Orleans after Katrina. Third world country, fly in their telephony systems and create a telephony system in cases of disaster. And that's what Avenio does. And if, you ha if you're not familiar with them, go to their website. They've done some amazing stuff. So they had this idea that besides bringing, bringing telephony systems in, if they could bring in a whole micro data center that could run off of solar power and make it so efficient and so uh, dependable that these people could now have greater communication and greater capability to run stuff. So they created this contest to design what they called the micro data center using up to 15 small arm boards hooked together. They have a 16-port uh, gigabit switch in there, 10 SSD drives to hold data, and then able to run off of either 12 or 24-volt solar panel being plugged into them. They wanted to have a UPS built into the system in case the solar panel plug came unplugged or something like that. The system itself would still be alive that the SSDs would have a chance to shut down normally. They needed to have it passively cooled because, as you know, the fan is the first thing to go, and particularly in a saltwater environment. And they wanted it to be portable and manufacturable to have it at the lowest possible cost. They wanted to have a Faraday cage because a lot of times these are used in a telephony situation and telephone standards say you need to have stuff in Faraday cages. And in their specifications, they said, we wanted to run a lamp stack. Now, I looked at the lamp stack and thing from a computer science perspective. I said, what do you mean by that? They didn't really have any good uh, answer at the time. We'll get a little bit more into that later on. They separated the contest into two parts. Part one was developing the hardware. And they, they said, you have to be teams of three to seven people. We don't want individuals doing this but three to seven people in the team. The prize was 10,000 US dollars for the first prize. And the second prize was up to seven for the seven people in the team, next to seven tablets. Now, part of the specification was that everything which you donated, everything which you had in your design had to be open so that they were free, and anybody was free, to take any of the designs and combine any of the components together into an overall Uber design. 
Uh, you can sign up. This part of the contest is already over. They haven't actually announced the, they have announced the winner, but they haven't actually put up the specifications for the winning prize. We're expecting that to happen any moment. I, with a couple of other people, did make an input to this. We called it the Pirata Entry, and we estimated its cost at $2,600 complete, UPS, systems, everything, uh, estimated. And we think we could bring that down in manufacturing cost. Uh, as far as the design of the box, we had a design to be very compact. It fit in an overhead airplane uh, cabinet. You could carry it on as, as, over, as luggage. And it was completely redundant. The only thing that did fail, that, that was singular to fail, was the switch. And because the manufacturer said there was typically a 75-year mean time between failure and a switch, we felt that that was okay. <laughs> We did have failover with SADC between all of the boards, and we thought it was very good. We placed nine out of the 50 different entries, so I'm waiting to see what the upper eight entries look like. So this is the next step for the contest, and this is where Debian comes in. I'm coming here to tell you about this because I think that the people in this room and the people watching this video are probably the best people in the world to design the levels of software that would go into this system. And you, you know, we haven't de they haven't defined what their needs are yet, but I have defined a small list that I think should be there. Easy to install, and there's a talk right after this that I'm going to hold around for that I think will help them with that. Almost easy to manage. Notice I didn't say easy to manage, because as we all know, no software is easy to manage. But if we can make it almost easy to manage, that would be good because a lot of these units are going into places where they probably don't have a lot of experience with computer science. Make it scalable, so you can start off with maybe two or three processing units or, your, or disk units and then go up from there. High availability, of course, is, 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 is new, and stable. But we don't know, and they haven't defined yet, where we should think of this as a cloud type of device, perhaps a local cloud device with you know, further storage in some other cloud, some other one, it's kind of a mirror site, where it should be a client-server type of relationship or a high-performance computing type of relationship, I don't know. So for the people in the room, you can start thinking about this, and as they announce the contest, you're welcome to join it, and I think that we might be able to have a very good solution coming out with Debian as the basis. So that was the first contest, and now I'm going to talk about a second contest, yet another computer contest, GNU Linux. If you think about it, it's kind of like 45 years old. It started with Ken and Dennis sitting down at their PDP-7 and writing all of the kernel in machine language. In fact, the entire operating system was written in machine language. C hadn't been invented yet. And then when the PDP-7 kind of ran out of steam and address space, they bought a PDP-11 and wrote the entire kernel in machine language. And after the second time, Dennis said, that's it, I'm not doing this again, and he invented C. <laughs> and then they wrote the entire kernel again in C, and they said, Phew. That's the last time we'll have to do that. And then they went over to an Interdata 832, and all of a sudden they realized, oh, this is a different architecture, so we have to write the kernel again. And you, you know the history. But back in those times, 64K of memory was gigantic. And therefore the programs, a lot of the programs were written using data flow type of techniques and things like that, so that the program and the memory and the operating system could fit into a certain type of space. But things have changed. No longer is memory $128,000 for 64K, as I one time paid, but it's now more like $10 for a gigabyte or less. That's not to excuse bloated code, because as we all know, the, core, the, the cache of the CPU is still tends to be rather small, if it's there at all, but you know, then there's multiple levels of cache. That's also a thing. CPUs are multi-core. And even then, we may have multiple CPUs that are multi-core on the same board. And algorithms have changed 
and become more prevalent. And algorithms have become more acceptable as the memory sizes become larger. Back in the day, pipelining was something you did in plumbing, not in electronics. And cash was something that you put in your pocket on your way to the bank, okay? But both of these things are now prevalent simply because the electronics have become cheap enough to allow them to become prevalent. I remember when the GNU compilers produced code that was 30% less efficient than commercial compilers. And today, a lot of the GNU compilers are toe-to-toe -to -toe with commercial compilers in terms of efficiency. And, and, and we also have other free compilers available. So, and the need for assembly language has decreased. And sometimes it's actually detrimental to have assembly language in your code, particularly inline assembly language that throws off the optimization techniques that the compiler has been generating up until that point. So we're announcing the Mad Dog and Linero's GNU Linux optimization program. Now, I don't have any type of, of, of fancy name for that other than that. But what we, what we did, in fact, Steve, sitting here in the front row, went through the code in Debian and in Fedora and found out that there were 1,400 different modules in there that had ARM 32-bit code in it or assembly language code in it and therefore were not portable to ARM 64. And that, of course, is a problem because ARM wanted to bring out their ARM 64 a chipset, and they wanted to be able to have uh, Linux running on it. But I came along and looked at this and said, you know, there's also an, an issue of performance on this, and maybe we should be looking at these pieces of code and not just porting them, but also spending some time to do some optimization. And so the goals of the contest are, number one, to make sure that all these modules do work on 64-bit ARM to compile and test them. Sometimes it's just a matter of testing them. Now that Debian has a, uh, an actual distribution, Jesse, that, that formally supports ARM64, it may be that people can just take and test the code, check it off, and say, yes, it works. Or we find that it doesn't work, then the people have to go upstream to the upstream people that haven't, you know, where it hasn't gotten into the package yet, and say, Does, are you working on this? And if not, if that doesn't work, well, then they would put a bug entry into the bug tracking system of the project and say, your code needs to work on ARM64, and then they can go in and perhaps do the work themselves and submit the patch to the upstream developers. But besides all of that, to take a look at some of these packages and say, can I improve the performance of them? <coughs> can I spend some time? And, and the interesting thing, too, is the performance is not just in the speed of the application. We'll get to that in a moment. And then to take all the information that we learn from these performance improvements and try and create a course where we could teach performance programming. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in the old days, performance was you plugged your computer system into the wall, and how fast did your program run? And today, performance is measured by, in some cases, how long does my battery last? And it's not just about phones, but it's things like if you're Google and you have a server farm, does this mean that you can only buy, you only have to buy 9,000 servers instead of 10,000 servers? that you only use 900 megawatts of electricity instead of a gigawatt of electricity. That's what performance and efficiency means today. And so the categories of performance that we would like to measure are memory utilization. You may be going, still going into an embedded system where you don't have 16 gigabytes of RAM or 32 gigabytes of RAM, but instead you have half a gigabyte of RAM or less. Cache utilization. A friend of mine named David Mossberger Tang did an experiment with the Alpha processor. He took two large arrays 
and multiplied them together using the same multiplication techniques you would learn in algebra. He then inverted the second array, did the multiplication, and inverted the answer, which gave you the same result. But because the second array was inverted, it meant that every single access of the data tended to access it in cache. The first method meant that almost every access was a cache miss. And therefore, the second technique ran 40 times faster than the first one. Or looking at it another way, it operated in 1 40th of the time. Now, these were very large arrays, obviously. But he dealt with very large problems. So, and, and another thing that Steve found was that a lot of different places, the same code had been cut and pasted or copied. And maybe this is something that we should go back into the compilers and say, let's create a compiler intrinsic so that instead of cutting and pasting this code, when there is an improvement, we make an improvement to the compiler and it improves every place on the next compilation. And there may be more categories of performance that we can be looking at. So we have some suggested prizes for this. They're not huge prizes, like a notebook from HP or something like that. But when you, when you sign up for the contest, when you go to the Linero site and you sign up, and you do one port, or you test one program, and say, yes, this works, then you get a fantastic Linero golf shirt and you also get 20 points. And I'll talk more about the 20 points later on. The next thing you get is you get your name entered into a contest. And that contest is for you to win a free, all expense paid trip to Connect. Now, what is Connect? Connect is a meeting held twice a year where all of the Lanero engineers come to this meeting from all over the world, from all of Lanero's companies member companies, and they talk about the projects they're working on face-to-face. -face. It's like a DevConf. But we hold it in a really nice hotel with really good food <laughs> and a lot of beer. And I think you could look at both Steve and myself <laughs> and realize that we like good food and good beer. Okay, And we typically have nice events to go to. For example, one year we had it in Dublin and we went to the Guinness Brewery for a long time. <laughs> and one year it was held in Hong Kong and we, you know, it's a very, very nice city. And we have these, you know, day trips and stuff. This year uh, coming up is one in Burlington, California. A lot of people go, oh, it's just Burlington. But we're going to go to the Computer Museum and have a nice reception there as far as Lanero's fifth anniversary. Uh, the one after that is going to be in Bangkok. Now, for those of you who live in Bangkok, maybe that's not such a great trip, but, you know, you might be able to come to U the USA or Europe in a future Connect. You would get the ability to come to Connect and spend a week there talking with the engineers and things like that. Now, the final thing, Oh, and, and so if you, that's if you do one port, you get your name put into the pool. You do two ports, you get your name put in twice. Three ports, you get your name put in. So if you put 10 ports in, you have a 1 in 140 chance of going to connect. Still doesn't sound like that great of a deal, but your name stays in the pool. And we do that connect, we do that drawing twice a year. So if the contest goes for four years, and I'll get to the moment is the length of the contest, then you have f four times that, you know, 10 ports. So 40 chances out of 1,400 to go to connect. So it mounts up. It's better than being struck by lightning or winning the lottery. <laughs> Finally, you get an accumulation of 20 points towards a goal. And part of that goal is to win one of these little ARM development systems from a, pro from a program we call the 96 Boards program. Uh, Linero noticed that a lot of the 64-bit ARM chips 
came on boards that were relatively expensive for developers to get. Uh, some boards may cost $600, and it's kind of, you know, out of this realm for a hobbyist. But they came up with a program to make a bunch of series of little boards, and this is one of them. They're all the same size, and they all have the connectors in about the same place. They all have the same type of mounting holes, and it gives a space in the middle of the board for, our, for Lanero's customers to be able to put their system on a chips so that they can then innovate with these and hand them out to developers at a relatively low price. Uh, as I said, the, the goal for this type of a board, which we call the consumer or developer board, is that it would cost less than $100 for either a 64-bit or 32-bit system. We have another size board, which is more stuff on it, called the enterprise board, which is more for servers and things like routers and things like that, that would, has a goal of having it under 300 US dollars. But it would have more memory, more controllers, things like that. Now the side effects of the, oh, I should go back to this for a moment. Each one of these boards is going to have a certain cost. But every time you do a port or you do a performance enhancement, you'll get $20 towards the cost of buying one of these boards. And so if you do five ports, you will get the choice of choosing one of these two boards. The bottom board is one from Broadcom, which has a Snapdragon uh, chip on it. It's also a 64-bit chip. So you get a chance of choosing one of the boards, and there'll be more boards later on. You'll be able to assign your points to whatever board you want. Now, the side effects of all of this is that you learn a really cool assembly language, or not. You really don't have to learn ARM 9 assembly language if what you do is you eliminate the assembly language, which is in the code. If you say, I'm going to do this only with an upper-level language, I'm going to let the compiler do this work, and you eliminate the assembly language, then you really don't have to learn the assembly language of ARM64. Uh, you'll learn some, maybe, learn some code analysis techniques. I'm sure a lot of people in the room already know these type of things. But again, a lot of this is aimed towards university students. And we hope that college professors, and we have had college professors, actually use this program to teach the students programming efficiency and assembly language and computer architecture, trying to make these programs be more efficient. If what you're doing is, whoop, I went too fast. If what you're doing is, oh wow, how did I do that? <laughs> Sorry about that. If what you're doing is just the assembly language port, then our needs of, of, of this are very simple, is that you tell us what you did to create the patch, did you eliminate the assembly language, what versions of the compiler and OS did you use for testing, things like that. If you're doing performance, we're going to ask you to give us a little bit more information. What was the performance of the application ahead of time? How did you do the testing? And what is the performance levels of the application afterwards? And there's yet another prize for the best performance in any given connect segment. The person who gets the best performance ratio increase will automatically get a trip to connect. We would ask that you, that you present this to the connect engineers as the work you did. Uh, we have lots of resources that so we keep building on, different books on uh, different compilers and the way they work and optimization techniques and ARM assembly language. And the time frame of this is immediately. It's actually been going on for about a year now. Um, and we're looking for a university to be a home to this course, that we feed this information to them, and they build up this course and then make the course open to other universities to share the information. So what should you do now? Go to the site, performance.lonero.org. You can read the information about the contest. If you decide to participate, you can then log in and type in some information, which we only need to be able to ship you your T-shirts and, and, and systems and stuff like that. Um, choose one of the modules to work on. Now, once you've chosen that module, it belongs to you. 
Nobody else can choose that module. You choose the module, it belongs to you. You start working on it. If you finish porting, you go back to the site, you mark it as ported. If you decide to increase the performance, you go back to the site, choose it for performance improvement, mark it as improved. If you decide, no, I don't have time for this, then fine, go back to the site, release the module so that somebody else can get it. That's perfectly okay. Because it's only recently that these boards have become available, we've been advocating that people use QEMU to do the porting. It's obviously a little bit harder to use QEMU to do performance work. However, since we're also advocating getting rid of the assembly language, you could do the performance work on almost any other matching type of hardware, such as Intel 64. And if you get the performance out of that, we can apply that to ARM64. And then you pick the module to investigate for porting your performance. With that, it's the end of my talk. If you have any questions, I'll be around for the rest of the week. I am leaving on Friday to go to a different conference. Uh, but there's my email address, and there's the uh, address of the site again. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions right now? I may have a minute or two. Okay, thank you. <laughs>